Welcome to the Branding Boardroom, the podcast where we discuss brand strategy and how it should be understood, formulated, and implemented by senior corporate decision makers. Our guests range from prominent CEOs to accomplished academics and thought leaders. But there's so much more. They're also interesting people. And on the show, you'll get to learn about their stories and about the advice that they give to the world's top companies. My name is Ivo Ganchev. I'm your host and a senior executive at Top Brand Union, a Chinese consultancy which publishes influential ranking tables in the branding industry. We also organize the annual China Brand Festival. And this year, it's taking place right here in Changsha, where our secretariat is located. Now follow me into the branding boardroom. Sophie Bowman is a multi-award winning social media entrepreneur. She's an accomplished expert in branding, public relations and marketing. Sophie is a Forbes Council member and the founder of several companies, including Brand Branding and ConvertYourFollowers.com. In addition to her previous accolades, in 2022, she was named Entrepreneur of the Year at the American Business Awards, receiving a Gold Stevie Business Award. Sophie's clients include global superstars such as Kanye West and John Legend, as well as established companies such as Saatchi and Saatchi. Sophie has also managed branding campaigns for some of the most well-known global events, such as London Fashion Week and the 2012 Olympic Games. She has recently been named as one of nine inspirational women to watch by Yahoo News. Sophie has lectured at Miami Ad School and she has authored the authoritative book How to Convert Your Social Media Followers to Customers. She's a highly sought public speaker and has VIP speaker status at the Wall Street Conference. Sophie has been widely covered by various media outlets such as Success Magazine, Lifestyle Magazine and Business Insider. And it's my great pleasure to welcome today, Sophie Bowman. Hi, Sophie. Where are you calling from? Hi, guys. I'm calling from Miami today. Well, it's a great pleasure to have you on our podcast. Thank you for having me. Of course. Uh, we're uh, most honored to have you here. So we've, uh, of course, uh, spoken about your previous achievements at the beginning of the podcast, and uh, you've been tremendously successful. You've built a great reputation and a considerable following within the industry. So there is a lot to talk about today, and I'm sure that our viewers are really excited about this episode. But uh, before we get into it, let's start by telling your story to our audience. How did you get to where you are today? What was your early career like, and uh, where did your passion for business come from in the first place? Uh, I love that question. So my background is interesting in the sense of... Um, I very much had a Richard Branson mentality to just say yes to every opportunity that came along, figure it out along the way, which obviously comes with a lot of stories, <laughs> horror stories, funny stories, but success stories, because I really believe that was like the driving force behind, you know, my career becoming successful is just ha going for so many different opportunities that it's like law of probability, you know? You have to get something. If you're kicking on 20 doors, you're gonna get at least five. So I think with that mentality, you know, I was working as a teacher in London and it was working with special needs children, something I always loved. But when they decided to, you know, change the law and um, everything else around education, I was like, okay, it's now or, at, or now or never, I have to get out. It's kind of like sink or swim. I don't want to teach for the rest of my life. I want to do something amazing. And that's around that time, I'd kind of fallen in love with business. You know, I had my own side hustle selling, you know, creative writing, copywriting, um, marketing, digital marketing, social media. So I was already kind of doing all this, um, you know, side hustle stuff. But turning 30 was, you know, a really big kind of milestone. So I think I had a little bit of an early midlife crisis. And um, 
you know, I just decided to quit my job and make my side hustle a kind of creative agency and relocated to Morocco for two years just because I wanted to travel as well. So I just decided to do everything at once. Um, then around six years ago, I came to Miami and uh, I think that was the real power move for me. Um, coming to America being, you know, European, you have that bonus of knowing a lot of different uh, markets. And luckily for me, you know, having sold all of these different services, I had clients all over the world. So I've been lucky enough to, you know, work with clients in Asia and work with clients uh, US or, you know, from Paris. So that's been a lot of like building that network has been, um, you know, the second kind of power move to success. And then, you know, global domination next step <laughs> honestly so I've always been kind of a little bit boho at heart you know like free spirit traveler but I also when I came to Miami I had it in mind that you know I really wanted to set up roots and kind of build a foundation like have a home for the first time really ever because to me you know rental property is not home you feel like you're constantly living out of a suitcase kind of um so I think, you know, when I came to America with that different mentality, um, I personally stayed in Miami um, because I love, you know, the weather, which sounds crazy. But, you know, I get to wake up to the ocean every morning. Um, I see it from my balcony. I see dolphins and manatees. You just can't have that kind of lifestyle in a lot of other places. So although Miami wasn't the best move in terms of business stuff, because i probably would be way further along if I was in New York and on a lot more money. But, you know, for me, lifestyle is important. And I can't imagine going back to live in a, a, you know, a city full time after, you know, being a beach girl, I would miss the ocean. So you've been very successful over the years. Uh, and definitely it seems to have been a good decision to move to the US and to Miami as well specifically. But what do you think has made you so successful? Do you think that uh, there were perhaps some skills that you learned uh, during your earlier career as a teacher or from some other experiences? Or do you think it's uh, something else perhaps that has uh, brought to you this uh, level of success? Uh, definitely perseverance. <laughs> I think that's just, you know, my um, best friend's husband, um, the Napola family are like my adopted family over here in Florida. Um, and her husband would always say to us, like, just start, you know, because you can sit around planning, 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 talking about stuff forever. But when you just start, you just kind of figure it out along the way. And that became like, you know, my mental kind of, motivation um very much like you know just do it or whatever just start throughout your uh your uh, work and also when we've had our conversations uh you definitely you've, you've always spoken very openly and you have a very fun personality you're definitely a ball of energy uh and you have so many uh ideas but uh, the way that you bring them in is uh so natural and so open and you tend to work with uh, quite a lot of high-end clients and you tend to appear a lot in public. So uh, what I've been wondering about is, do you always keep this uh, sort of open way of communication and this uh, natural personality or do you have to perhaps hold back when you talk to senior executives and, or when you talk to uh, magazines or when you go on TV shows? Um, so how do you sort of uh, manage that when you uh, when you are in different environments? Um, honestly, I'm always going to be, you know, myself, but, you know, around like more corporate executives and stuff. I mean, you have to match the energy, right? So it's all about kind of being a chameleon and a good entrepreneur, a good business person is going to know that you do have to adapt yourself a little bit to kind of, you know, match the energy at that moment. So, you know, it would be kind of silly, I guess, in a sense for people to kind of come in and think you can be exactly the same in every culture and every, you know, everything else because you can't. Well, of course, uh, all of that sounds uh, like it's uh, fascinating. And uh, now you've uh, started talking about social media, which is, uh, of course, one of your key areas of expertise. And um, 
this seems like a, a very nice segue of moving into uh, this topic as well. Now, one of the hot trends on social media these days is uh, working with influencers and uh, building campaigns uh, which involve them as well. So um, what uh, I'd just like to start with here is a, a bit of a conceptual or definitional question. Now, of course, we've had... Uh, uh, celebrities or other well-known people within communities influence the preferences um, of the market for a very, very long time. But uh, the concept of influencers these days seems to be quite new in the way that it has developed um, on social media. So when you look at, for example, celebrities in the past and uh, influencers these days, um, would you say that uh, the these two concepts are fundamentally different, or uh, you would uh, perhaps um, find a lot of similarities between them as well? Honestly, yeah. I've been lucky enough to um, work with both, you know, the big celebrities and also the influencers. And I think the real differentiation was, you know, with the, the movement of kind of, I guess it was the rise of Kim Kardashian. Um, and that became really popular, you know, people really then started understanding, okay, she's, you know, being paid to show us this and people really became kind of close to it. So I think what brands really figured out is that, you know, we, especially women, also men, of course, we follow people that we're really kind of interested in the their niche is like our favorite thing. So let's say it could be makeup for darker skin tones or, you know, I'm going to follow very specific people because I like their style. I like who they are as a person. And that's a lot more personable um, to, you know, connect with an influencer because especially if they've, you know, made uh, recommendations before and you've purchased products because you've seen them through them and they've all been amazing, then of course you're going to keep going back. And I think, um, you know, most countries are starting to figure out now that it it's major, like influencer marketing, you know, it's normally one of the first costs to be cut. And I just read something in Business Insider yesterday saying, you know, uh, companies are going to start cutting off, you know, their marketing budget, their, um, you know, everyone's trying to save costs where they can. But I'm seeing a completely different story because, you know, I'm seeing a rise in clients wanting to connect and work with influencers on the long term, which is exactly, you know, the, the whole idea of influencer marketing. I mean, myself being an influencer on the side, um, something that I kind of fell into, I built my own social media kind of as a a calling card to potential clients and also to have an account to test certain things before, you know, I go AWOL on the client's account. So that's the only reason why I built mine, but it's also ended up being another revenue stream. Um, you know, I have a lot of uh, brands now, um, you know, like sending me really expensive products in return for posting about it. But the trick with influencer marketing is, you know, yeah, it's great for free products and stuff to send us, but if it's only just one off free product that we post, that's not going to be a value. You know, there's a reason why certain brands have been very successful, like um, Fashion Over is a great example of, you know, very aggressive marketing and they know their clientele. Um, and they built the brand pretty much purely on influencer marketing. Um, so, you know, it's still very, very powerful and, you know, something that when I come over to China next year, I'm sure we're going to end up doing some kind of workshop on that because influencer marketing is not going anywhere. And with the recession about to hit, you know, the entire globe in this post COVID mayhem, it's definitely going to be something that, you know, people are going to have to get into influencer marketing because it's the only cost effective way to reach a certain number of people online. Definitely. It doesn't seem like it's a trend that's going away anytime soon. And um, of course, it's something that companies have to think about. Now, you're very experienced in terms of working with uh, influencers and uh, perhaps uh, co-creating campaigns as well together as well. But in order to... Um, 
do this successfully, of course, you have to get influencers uh, who are actually uh, appropriate in terms of uh, matching well with the brand. And you want to get um, influencers uh, that are the best fit for a particular company. So the question here is, how do you do this? How do you get their attention in the first place? How do you get your uh, message opened? How do you select the right influencers? Um, and uh, how do you approach them about a collaboration? So that's a really good question because I think sometimes, you know, being on both sides of the fence, being an influencer and a brand person, you know, I see all the mistakes. So first of all, you have to have a really strong brand. You know, like if I see a message from you and go check out your Instagram page, I need to see activity. I need to understand immediately from your feed what you do. Your bio has to tell me, you know, what you do and why you're reaching out to me. It just has to click. Um, one little trick that I used to use when I was trying to find influencers for a brand is you know first off you want to find influencers that share that niche so let's say for example i'm working with a cosmetic brand then i only really want to deal with makeup artists and beauty influencers um and sometimes you can go a little outside of that scope um if someone's more of a lifestyle influencer but they have a very good local following um but I think it's best to start, you know, maybe go on Instagram and search certain hashtags. Let's say you're a, you know, we'll just stay with the cosmetics brand. Um, you have a beauty brand in China, then you would want to go through, you know, beauty influences and then make it very specific. Uh, make it local influences if you're a local business. If you're kind of global platform, then you're in a, better position because you can use all types of influences from all over the world. You know, a very good example of that again is Fashion Nova. Um, but the most ideal thing really, like once you have everything with your brand, you know, very concise and strong, you can then reach out, you know, maybe by direct message and say, you know, you have to address me. That, sorry, I just thought of another really important tip. Um, Always, 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 when you message uh, an influencer, if you're going to direct message them on Instagram, whatever, make sure you start the message with, hi, their first name. Because if you don't do that, then it's immediately obvious to me that, um, you know, you're just spamming. You're just going through. You're not really taking the time to find influencers. And as an influencer, that's, a you know, an immediate red flag because if you're just taking anyone and everyone like that's just you know it's going to be messy and i don't want to be seen to support a messy brand you know so that's kind of the most important step you know look at your social media is it obvious to a potential client as soon as they hit on your page are they going to understand what you're selling what you do within three seconds um once you have that set up then you can have you know, a template for a message you send to influencers, you know, like, hi, Sophie, um, you know, we've been following you and we love your branded posts. We would love to discuss, you know, a collaboration with you if you're interested, you know, please fill out this link, um, availability, and let's schedule time to talk. Keep it very simple, you know, don't send a very long, 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 long message. No one's going to read it. <laughs> Just get the, you know, I'm very much a fan of short and sweet. Just get directly to the point. Ask them what they want, you know, ask for their media card. That way it kind of shows what you're, you know, what you're doing. And you'll also get insights from that. You know, how many followers do they have? Where are their followers? Because that makes a big difference if you're a global brand or a local brand you know, you have to pick influences based on geographic location, um, what their niche is. You know, there's a lot of factors that have to be taken into consideration. And like you said before, um, you know, the influences you go for can make or break your brand. You know, like, let's just say um, with influences, if you had a luxury brand, but then you're using influences that kind of also promote cheap fashion brand you know it's not everything has to be very concise and a consistent brand tone and that's why you know people like you and I exist because 
even though we know branding inside out, it's amazing, you know, how many businesses are still missing out on so many sales and so much opportunity because they don't have a strong social media presence. These steps are definitely really helpful, uh, both in terms of uh, the practicalities of how you approach influencers and, of course, as well as uh, uh, creating the brand strategy as well and making sure that um, everything aligns. And these influencers, of course, they already have uh, big followings. And this is also something that... Um, a lot of companies hope to do um, as well, and this is one of the important metrics on their social media, how many followers they have. So if we uh, flip things from the perspective um, of the company, uh, this is something that uh, it has to do as well to attract followers. So when you are giving advice to a company on how to um, do this uh, themselves, uh, what would you tell them? What are some strategies that you would perhaps uh, uh, um, think are useful for our audience in terms of attracting a big following? For me, I think building a following is, you know, you have to go with authenticity. Like people expect and kind of deserve a lot more from brands now. You know, like they don't just want fast fashion brand they want a brand that is thinking about you know where the products are made they they want to know are you helping the environment you know like there's so many different factors that go into it now in terms yeah building a following you know you have to create content with who your target consumers are in mind so once you start nailing that then you can get really kind of personal with your followers so you know show behind the scenes create a lot of reels because a lot of brands don't realize that let's say for example if I post a static image or a video on my Instagram feed the only people that are going to see that are some of my followers who are online at that time or you know a few people that might find me via hashtags whereas you know if you create a reel especially with a trending um, sound you can go from you know a thousand likes to fifteen thousand views so you know just by that simple trick of you know using different images or creating reels it's very very simple um and instead of you know you're multiplying your online reach by like 15 times just by using a reel and i think a lot of brands now kind of know about that but they're still not doing it well, that makes sense, definitely, especially with the decreasing attention span um, across the world, really, and with a lot of these uh, new interactive uh, social media platforms, uh, the TikTok-style apps uh, that uh, show you a lot of these short videos. Um, reels seem to be something that is uh, certainly uh, picking up. Uh, but um, once you uh, start to... Um, build that following, uh, sometimes you get a lot of traction and things snowball and that's fantastic. Uh, and sometimes perhaps you might not get uh, as much traction to begin with. So if this happens, if you're not getting a lot of traction, uh, some companies have... Um, ended up uh, doing things like uh, buying followers at times. That's uh, one of the uh, things that's probably uh, not as uh, talked about these days, but uh, it's certainly uh, something that still remains. Um, so what would you say to these types of companies? Should they continue with their strategy if they're not getting traction? Should they buy followers or should they change their entire approach? That's a really good question. And I think, you know, what I see a lot is uh, an increase of brands using uh, an existing member of staff to handle the marketing and it doesn't work like that. You know, that's like trying to put a random person off the street into a scientist job and expecting them to, you know, know what to do. You have to be educated in social media and if your strategy isn't working you've got to change the strategy you know it's like so anything else in business if something's not working you change the strategy and if you don't know how you bring in an expert you know now we're in a really cool position where we can connect with experts from anywhere in the world so you know like that's changed the game companies and corporations they can now bring in a contractor such as myself which i'm seeing a huge increase in by the way um 
you know, I just found out yesterday that I've won a marketing leadership award. So I'm being flown to Dubai and um, then Vegas to collect awards and speak at the events and everything. Corporations, there's literally no point in buying followers because one of the most uh, important things is your engagement rate. If you're an aspiring, you know, influencer or whatever, everyone's going to look at those insights. So let's say you buy followers. They're probably going to be fake accounts or accounts that were set up and haven't been posted on since like a year or two years. You know, the Instagram algorithm is highly intelligent. So first of all, it knows if you're doing it. But second of all, it just looks so bad for your brand. People instantly think you're not ethical. You know, you're trying to cheat the system. These are not good for building, you know, brand longevity and you know, loyalty and trust in your brand. So it's best not to do it. It's better to have 500 engaged followers than 5,000 that don't interact on anything because, you know, people are a bit more tech savvy now. They'll go to your Instagram feed, for example, and they will look. Let's say, you know, you, you purchased 100,000 followers, but if I go and look at your post, there's like three likes per post, no comments you know, it's obvious. Yeah, as you mentioned, uh, it's becoming increasingly easier these days to figure out uh, which are the real and the quote unquote fake followers. Um, and of course, you can also monitor engagement levels quite easily as well. Um, and a lot of people uh, do this more and more to try and differentiate and to see uh, which companies actually um, have uh, a, an engaged group of, uh, of followers on their social media. Uh, but of course, once you start to build a following and once you start getting traction, uh, the next step is naturally to try and uh, convert your followers, uh, just like the name of your company. So I think you're perhaps one of the best people in the world uh, to ask this question to. How do we actually convert our followers? Don't really get asked it ever, which is kind of irony. Um, there's a lot of different ways to convert followers. I'm a big fan personally of offering value. So let's say you collaborate with another business as a non-competitor on a giveaway what you want to do is always be driving the traffic to your website. So let's say you post something on Instagram. Hey, we're doing a giveaway with this influencer. You could get like um, $500 worth of products or, you know, whatever. So you want to say on all the social media posts, you know, click this link in bio. That needs to go to a landing page on your website where you're taking their data. You know, they to enter the contest, they have to drop their, their name, their email. Um, if you can get more information from them, even better, like their city, gender, you know, all of this kind of stuff. Um, and what you do by, the, you know, by doing, just driving that traffic, you now have, you're going to have a database of emails. So once you retarget these, you know, new email users, you can multiply your sales very, very quickly because, you know, obviously with the giveaway, you are going to get some people that are just there for the free stuff, but you're also going to get people that, uh, you know, if you target your ad correctly behind it, you're going to get people that are genuinely interested in your type of business, you know, your type of product or service, whatever it is you sell. So once you have that information and you send them an email, let's say a few days or a week, two weeks, whatever later, you say kind of this product you were looking at, it's now 50% off. Nine times out of 10, that person was already interested anyway. So if they see, you know, a big, discount or some kind of value like uh you know they're gonna do it so it's really about just being smart and just offering that value to people because a lot of times you know we see businesses asking for an email on their website okay but why you know why should i give you my email i already get like 100 200 um spam emails a day so you have to offer that value um it doesn't necessarily have to be a giveaway. It can also be, um, you know, they go to your landing page and they download a free ebook that's relevant to your business. I mean, whatever it is, just offer value and people will come. Of course, this is something that um, 
also uh, makes the engagement worthwhile uh, for the people that are visiting your website or uh, following your social media uh, accounts as well. So as we've uh, been speaking about social media strategy, uh, one of the concepts that we touched on before was uh, the idea of uh, authenticity, and it came up a couple of times already uh, when we spoke about the way that uh, perhaps you uh, conduct yourself and the way that you dare to be yourself and, and speak quite openly in most situations. Um, and also when it came to uh, brands and influencers um, as well. Now, uh, when uh, people are very uh, authentic on social media in terms of the way that they promote their personal brand, it might be um, the entrepreneurs or it might be um, the influencers, uh, do you think that it always helps or can it sometimes also hurt when you do this on uh, uh, social media? Yeah, and we're dealing with you know a very volatile um, social media world now where you know, we have a lot of trolls. So I think in terms of like, you know, you can still be authentic and share, you know, behind the scenes stuff about your brand and the people who work behind the brand. You can do all of that, but I think it's just a general good tip to stay away from really the the conversations that really start, you know, a lot of trouble. And that would be like religion, um, that's a definite one to stay away from or politics, you know, anything like that, because it is so volatile. You don't, you know, you just, there's no need to talk about it unless your products or services are, you know, relevant to that, which most aren't. So I think that's the easiest way. I mean, you know, there's a lot of it is common sense, but a lot of it is also being respectful of other cultures. So that's why we're living in a really good time now where, you know, we can work with professionals from anywhere in the world for the most part, you know, we can all do it remote or hybrid, um, which is now a better situation because now we have teams from all over the world. So we know if something's offensive, um, you know, in one culture and not another. And all of these things are really important to know, especially if you're aligning yourself to have a global brand. In this very diverse world that we live in, um, of course, this also uh, tells people, um, uh, it shows them what your values are in terms of being respectful to different cultures as well um, through your actions of uh, perhaps um, making sure that you don't touch on topics that offend people in the first place. And uh, it's certainly a good uh, preventative strategy as well. Um, both for uh, uh, personal branding and for uh, companies. Um, now, when you build uh, your own brand or as a, a, a well-known person, celebrity or influencer, um, there is a, a little bit of an intuitive um, aspect to being authentic. You could just film yourself behind the scenes or at home, and this way you're, you're uh, letting people sort of peek into uh, your life or into something that they wouldn't normally see. But when it comes to brands, if you're building a corporate brand, um, what makes it authentic? Um, can you engineer authenticity and an authentic campaign for a brand? Or does it come from the fact that the product or the company represents something that was there in the first place? Uh, what's your take on the way that you would build authenticity from the perspective of a, a, a corporate brand? I think um, it's an interesting one because obviously working in branding for so many years, you know, the number one mistake that I see, especially from startups is, you know, they're trying to run before they walk and they're trying to push a brand without really knowing who their brand is. That's a big, big problem. Um, you know, I used the example before of convertyourfollowers.com purely, you know, I created that because it says what it is. It's not complicated. And there was, you know, minimal copy and everything on the website. It is what it is. You know, either you want to convert your followers or you don't. Do you want to make more money or do you not? <laughs> it's that simple. So, you know, before people try and get into the, you know, the authenticity and the story, you know, all of that will come once you have a really powerful brand blueprint and by that you know I've always gone one step further if you have a brand strategy you know if you don't have someone that can do that in-house you can go on websites like people per hour you know find people like me or like yourself and um, you know 
create that brand voice for you, that whole brand tone, because until you have that, like all of your efforts are going to be futile because, you know, people aren't going to look at you and know immediately what you do, what you're selling. And they're just, you know, people can feel it. You know, it's like an energy thing. If you don't know who you are, we don't know who you are. So everything has to start with branding. I think that you're completely right in saying that, um, People, consumers, and I guess you could say the market as well is actually uh, quite smart. It almost operates like a, a collective brain in a way. Um, but markets are also very flooded these days, whether it comes to um, a market for buying certain products or uh, the events that get organized on a daily basis or even the influencer scene uh, where you have uh, every other 16-year-old kid in Los Angeles uh, trying to become an online uh, social media influencer. So... Of course, if you're authentic and if you have a very uh, well-defined and projected brand message, uh, it's easy to see how you differentiate yourself. But apart from this, or in addition to this, what else can you do to stand out from the crowd, to set yourself apart uh, from the others within your uh, field? I think for people to separate themselves from the competition, um, you know, you, you want to be yourself. Like, you want to... People are very much right now, they want to see that personal um, connection. So, you know, you might have noticed we're seeing a big change and all of a sudden there's all these documentaries about like, get to know the real Jennifer Lopez or, you know, all of this other stuff because right now that's trending. You know, if you have a factory that makes products, for example, um, a fashion brand, you know, then you want to show it being made. So there's a lot of ways that you can... Um, you know, separate yourself if you're in a very crowded market, which to be honest, everything is now. True, true. That's true. And uh, these are uh, some very practical tips as well that a lot of our uh, listeners and viewers could probably uh, simply uh, implement directly into their business. Uh, but a lot of them um, are also international companies. And when you're running a social media campaign and you're an international company, you usually have an international um, audience as well. So when you think about building a national following or reaching tw uh, um, towards a national market uh, versus an international one, do you think that there is any differentiation in terms of the way that you should approach this, your social media campaign, uh, and your message as well? I think so, definitely. Um, because, you know, if you have a local business that's going to change everything because you know your hashtags your geographic location everything has to be local whereas if you're looking to go global then you know you have to be a bit more generic i don't know if that answers the question properly yeah there is definitely um things like uh, the ones that you mentioned and the hashtags um, that are very easy to do uh, if you uh, if you know uh, how to approach them in order to reach your, your target crowd. Uh, but of course, to run your social media campaign, um, to implement your brand strategy properly, uh, you do need to dedicate a certain amount of uh, time and money. And these are resources which are always limited from a strategic uh, standpoint, whether you're a small business or a big one. Um, so... From your perspective, if you had to talk to um, uh, CEOs, what would you tell them is um, the appropriate amount of resources that they should allocate to their social media campaigns? And of course, here I'm not asking for a, a number of hours or a, a certain number of uh, dollars because uh, that would differ on a case-by-case -case basis, but perhaps uh, what are the ways that you would make that decision? What principles would you use to determine um, what part of your resources you allocate or what uh, proportion or what percentage of your resources would you allocate to something like uh, social media campaigns? Oh, okay. So I think once you have, you know, your strong brand tone, you want to have someone professional creating a strategy for you because you know, once you have a real strategy and you know what you have to do and how you're going to do it, then you can figure out the cost. Um, because, you know, some, um, 
Some campaigns can be incredibly cost effective. I mean, it really depends. But if you go for a professional like one of us, for example, um, you know, this is what we specialize in. Um, we know how to create something highly intelligent and something that actually gets results for the kind of budget, you know? So I think first the strategy comes first and then you figure out if the cost is feasible or not. And if it's not, then you figure out a way to do it um, at a cost effective way. And that's where you and I come in. You know, we've been doing this for how many years now? <laughs> well, there's always a solution. Yeah, that definitely sounds like a, a, a very good order of steps that uh, that any business should really take. Um, and this advice could apply both to large international companies or to, to small and medium uh, businesses as well. Um, and uh, when you are trying to create and to monitor the strategy uh, and the way it's implemented and the effect it has, of course, the best way to do this is to use uh, data. And um, there are a lot of metrics that people look at these days and that um, people talk about. So uh, what I also wanted to ask you is, uh, as an expert from your perspective, what kind of data do you monitor? Where do you uh, look at this data? How do you determine uh, whether a certain campaign is uh, doing well or no? Oh, I love that. So, you know, we're very lucky to have more intelligent, um, you know, platforms now. So let's say, for example, Instagram will give you the insight. So you want to be looking at all of that. Uh, another tip is to use, I don't know if you have a different version of it in China, but I use Bitly Link a lot because this will, once you use Bitly Link um, in a registered account, it will kind of tell you, give you analytics, and it will even go as far to tell you, okay, well, these hits on the link came from, you know, social media these came from email yeah definitely this uh, is uh, quite a comprehensive approach that might be perhaps uh, a little costly or it might take some time to begin with but it's going to save you a lot of cost and a lot of trouble over the long term because you're going to be able to uh, monitor um why things are sometimes working out better and sometimes not working out as well once you have um, a, a larger data set and not just uh, perhaps just some basic information on the number of uh, likes or comments or things like that. Um, and when you're managing an international campaign, of course, you have to deal with a lot of practicalities. You might be targeting audiences that are in different uh, time zones, uh, in different countries, speaking different languages. Uh, so what would you say um, or perhaps some of the ways that you should decide when to post or what languages to post in um, or some practical ways of addressing uh, a global um, audience? So I think, um, you know, obviously, if you're a global brand, it's slightly different because you are going to be dealing with all those different types of time zones. But again, you know, Insights is your best friend, really, because it will tell you like what days of the week um, your followers, for example, are most active or it will show you in the Insights, you know, which of your posts were the most popular in terms of online reach or in terms of engagement. So you want to be looking at your insights or have someone that that's their, you know, part of their job role is they look at those stats and insights every single week. Because let's say if you're posting, um, you started posting educational posts and all of a sudden those are taken off, then you know that what you were doing before can just be, you know, void. Um, you have to go where you're getting the results and that's, you know, again, once you have your brand figured out, if you come to people like you or myself, um, you know, we're the experts that we work as contractors. So we come in and kind of as an extra team member and we can set all of that up for you. But a lot of, again, you know, a lot of brands are trying to do all this stuff in house without the expertise and the insider knowledge. And that's why, you know, it doesn't work. Yeah, it definitely helps if you are able to have somebody that uh, truly understands what they're doing, why they're doing it, and who's able to sort of gather uh, data from different perspectives so that you can you can get a, 
a complete picture of what's happening. Um, and uh, definitely this is something that can help you also with uh, uh, time zones and with uh, other aspects of uh, global or sort of um, international, intercultural uh, branding campaigns as well. And picking off on that, um, you also have to, well, you don't have to, but uh, we end up using uh, hashtags so that we can increase um, the, um, the, the scope of the people that we're able to reach out to. And uh, this is something that's uh, a quite specific thing in and of itself. Uh, so how do you go about maybe selecting hashtags? Are you a fan of uh, hopping onto existing trends and uh, going with the flow, seeing what's trending and using the same hashtag, hoping that you're going to pop into people's news feeds or perhaps selecting new ones and unique ones and trying to create uh, a new trend uh, that uh, hopefully snowballs and attracts attention. How do you approach the, the hashtags issue? I think, um, so the best way with that, we used to have in the old days, you know, when we used to do 30 hashtags on every post, the 10, 10, 10 rule. So it would be kind of, you know, 10 posts um, could be really high trending um, hashtags. Like an example would be um, uh, post of the day, you know, or uh, what I wore today or outfit of the day. Ones like those are very generic and they're huge. Um, then you want to go with some small hashtags like um, let's say you have a fashion brand in Miami. You want to put hashtags that are very specific like Miami boutique, Miami star, Miami fashion. Um, then you want to kind of use some location hashtags like, uh, you know, Miami bloggers, Miami influencers, because you want to attract local talent to be brand ambassadors. Um, then you want to use, you know, you want to have a branded hashtag ideally, um, because let's say if, um, you know, I owned the hashtag, like convert your followers, I think a lot of other people are using it. Whereas if I branded that, um, you know, that way I can keep an eye on user generated content, which is highly valuable because let's say, um, you're a beauty brand. And if someone's always using that same hashtag all the time, your branded one, you can just go through Instagram and just pull people's content because as long as you're, you know, giving them the juice and tagging them on that post, like you can use that and it's your brand and that's a whole lot of content that you didn't have to spend the time creating. So branded hashtags are very important as well. Um, I have been seeing a massive shift recently in the number of people that have been contacting me to do influencer stuff. And I think that's purely because, um, you know, I was using a lot of trending hashtags recently because we had Miami Swim Week. So I think that made me a lot more visible. And also, um, you know, I use hashtags like Miami blogger, Miami influencer, um, and I come up very, you know, trending in that because I use them all the time. I definitely like your approach and it sounds like uh, it's a way of uh, getting the best of all worlds really uh, because that way you get to um, you get the attention of people who are following you specifically or people who are following uh, a certain location, what's going on there, like their city um, or a place that they're interested in and you also get, um, get to tag on to um, the trends that are uh, already picking up on social media as well. Now, as we're moving towards the uh, end of our conversation, uh, I think there are a couple of uh, quick questions that uh, I would ask to, I would like to ask you as well um, that might be of interest to your audience. And the first one is um, when we speak about uh, social media uh, launching campaigns and the way that it fits into a business strategy, are there any misconceptions um, when it comes to these things? Um, yeah, I think one of the main misconceptions is thinking that you can plan to do a viral video. I mean, obviously, you know, a thought goes behind these things, but I think now we're seeing a movement of, you know, people don't respond so well to like narcissist characters and the same is going to happen with brands. You know, we want to see that you're more than a brand. We want to see what you're passionate about, you know, like let's say for example, um, I have a fashion line. Well, I want to put some kind of charity, like collaborate with a charity, some bigger purpose than the brand that my target consumer 
is going to be interested in and share that passion. You know, it could be ocean conservation or helping recycle with plastic. You know, all of these things, um, you know, they give you credibility and they give you a lot of online reach because, you know, a lot of the campaigns I do now, I'll always collaborate with a charity because now we have a purpose driven campaign. And that is the big difference. You know, a lot of people think that you just create a video and, oh, it will go viral. No. Um, but if you're doing collaboration and you're adding purpose, then yes, it's much more likely to be, you know, go viral and be seen on a global scale. And this seems to be something that also um, has to do with a, a broader trend in society as well. There is a lot of people who are looking for meaning, looking for purpose um, in terms of their life and their career as well. Um, so this is definitely a very timely advice. And you've given us so many wonderful tips today, Sophie. Um, so uh, if you had one minute of the time of all of the global CEOs and you could tell them something really important that you'd like them to know or you'd like them to hear, what would your message be for them? It would be, first things first, don't do anything, repeat anything until your brand is very, very clear on exactly what you do and who you sell to. That is, you know, until you figured that out, you can't do anything else you know the second part is whether you know you reach out to me or not you know you need a contractor because if you don't bring in a professional to create that strategy then you know you're basing it on assumption rather than science and that's not going to work so you know there's ways you can go to convertyourfollowers.com drop your email um, that's another thing i'll say to the ceos if I have one minute of their time, get your branding right, take note of my website in case you need to ask questions, and then um, give me your emails because then I can sell them on something. <laughs> well, these are most wonderful and most important uh, tips, of course, for all of the business community. And uh, you've, uh, you've shared with us a wealth of knowledge, um, a great amount of uh, very, very practical tips that hopefully um, more companies can start to implement into their strategy so that um, they can bring out the best of, the, of themselves and uh, really help to uh, contribute towards uh, more positive uh, developments uh, more broadly in society as well. Um, so we would love to, of course, have you in China sometime soon. So uh, my last question for you, Sophie, today is, when are we going to get to see you here? I will be, so I was hoping to come to China next month, obviously with COVID and everything kind of reigniting, it's not possible, but I will be in China next year in August. Well, thank you very much again, Sophie, for all of these wonderful practical tips and hopefully uh, the business community and our audience will uh, take note of them to help bring out the best of companies and also to help make society better this way as well. We would love to have you in China and uh, I'm sure that uh, the executives here uh, would be very, very eager to meet you and to talk to you in person. So we look very much uh, forward to welcoming you here next year and thank you again for being on the Branding Boardroom.